Hey everybody, welcome back. I know at the end of the last part of the first lecture, the audio went out once I pulled up the pictures, and so I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and just point out some things, essentially talk about what I said uh, when the audio cut out. And I think I've got that fixed this time. So I wanna go ahead and pull up the, uh, pull up the, the picture of the Catacomb of Calixtus again. Um, so this again is the entrance to the catacomb. As you can see the, uh, at the very top, you've got, let me maximize it on my screen. At the top, you, you see the title, the catacomb uh, es Callisto, which I get, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, but the, uh, that, that's what it says essentially. Um, that's the outside of the catacomb. And obviously you could, I mean, you, you, can, you can pretty clearly tell where it was uh, built at. Generally, they were built on the outskirts of the city. Um, and so these are some pictures of what it looked like on the inside. Now you notice that again, this is a very narrow passageway to get through. Obviously it's very dark. The catacombs were built into the ground. We'll talk more about them in this week's lecture again. Um, another thing that you see here as well is that the uh, uh, is that that it's poorly lit, right? It, it's very it's built into the ground. You don't have a lot of lighting, and so artificial lighting is important to make sure that the uh, that that you could be able to see at least for us. So you could imagine back in the first few centuries really up until we had electricity, how dark it could get in there without having light. And you see handrails there as well. Uh, obviously they didn't have handrails back then, these were added on later. They actually offer, if you're ever in Italy, you can go and tour these catacombs uh, and they'll give, you a, they'll give you a guided tour of them. Uh, something that would probably be pretty neat if you ever had the chance to go visit Italy. All right, so Another thing too, this, this last picture, what you see is all these slits that are cut out into the rock. And this is where they would bury people. They would put them in smaller coffins and then they would, um, the idea is that they would put them into those slits and that's how they would uh, entomb or bury their dead. And obviously you could imagine that it, it probably didn't smell that great in there. Especially if you had bodies that were, you know, in the process of decaying. and you again see sort of it's a narrow passageway, but that's sort of what the catacombs looked at like on the inside. I thought that might be interesting to look at. And then the other two pictures, this is the slides from last time, so you should already have these notes. Um, yeah, okay, so what I was pointing out here again was the artwork that you see in the catacomb. Now you note how at the top you've got what appears to be a man with two doves on the side. Again, the doves sort of represented peace, um, certainly could reference Jesus. Uh, you see uh, on the, the side, you, you see images of maybe shepherds or things like that. Um, it's, it's a little hard to make out, but if you look right in the middle of that picture, you see that there are people gathered around a table and it looks like they're eating, uh, which is exactly what they're doing. Now, we'll talk about this week uh, again, this could be a reference to the Lord's Supper, um, and, and we'll sort of explain why that is in a moment, why you would often see depictions of the Lord's Supper, um, and something called the Love Feast, which we'll talk about later. So, th we'll talk about why you would see depictions of this in the catacombs in a minute. But just know, uh, and this is, you know, I'm not testing you on the, all the artwork or anything. This is just for your interest, hopefully this interests you. Just looking at some of the artwork that you found in the catacombs, because Christians took great lengths to, to make them look nice, um, which I think is interesting. And then these two pictures are pictures that you've probably, the one on the top left you might have seen before. I know I have before I started studying this. This is a portrait of what's called the Good Shepherd, which is a pretty, uh, pretty famous portrait, um, a piece of Christian artwork, so to say. You see he's got a lamb on his shoulders. He's got lambs that looks to be on the sides. If you see there on the bottom right, you've got a different uh, version of it, but sort of the same thing, a man carrying a lamb and other lambs around him. So well, that's sort of the beginning. Uh, I guess what we might could think of as you know, Christian art, what it looked like in the beginning. And I find that curious to look at. I find it interesting to look at, and uh, hopefully you do as well.
All right, so let's go ahead and get into part two. And here we're talking about worship practices within the church of the first few centuries. And we've got more pictures and uh, an audio clip to look at in a moment. And let me go ahead and I want to pull back up to our normal normal screen for a moment. I'll, I'll turn it back when we start looking at pictures. All right, so at this point you are looking uh, at the... Uh, at this point, we're talking about some of the assembling locations. That's one of the things that we'll talk about. And then we'll just talk about some general characteristics of what worship looked like uh, in the first four centuries, especially maybe some things that are a little bit different than what the New Testament has and, and maybe how that indicates some early departures. All right, so let's talk about some of the locations where they assembled. So we, we keep in mind that, you know, because Christians, uh, because you know, Christianity is not a legal religion at this point. You don't have any established buildings. So, you know, if we were to go back in time and, and we were to get in a time machine and go to the second, third, fourth centuries, at least the early part of the fourth century, we wouldn't go around a city and, and look around for a building that had Church of Christ on it. Uh, th that would be unheard of. You, would, you, you wouldn't expect to find anything because most churches didn't own uh, property to where they could build their own building. Now, as we talked about uh, last week, because of being a funeral society, uh, arguing that they were similar to funeral societies, this acquired the, the church as a whole to get land, but for the purposes of burying the dead, more so than building a building. So, one of the things that we might point out about not having an established buildings is that it it might have helped Christianity avoid further conflict that you saw was evident with uh, Judaism, right? We talked about how the Jew, Judaism and, and Rome uh, often did not get along because the Romans had a tendency to not respect the worship space of uh, the temple, right? Because you see different instances where unclean animals are killed within the temple and sacrificed. You see... Uh, depictions of the Roman Empire being put into the temple and, and in a way for the Jews it was a desecration of the temple. Well, Christians didn't have these public buildings like the Jews did and so you don't really have to worry about you know a church being desecrated by a Roman official because the church building didn't exist. And that leads us to talking about where Christians did assemble together. So we know from the New Testament one of the places where they assembled was the homes of Christians, and you have multiple references within that. And I will pull up my Bible for a minute. So Philemon chapter one verse two, you see Paul introduced. Uh, Paul writes that letter to Philemon, and, and Paul makes the uh, makes the point that Philemon uh, that that the church met in Philemon's house. Colossians four verse fifteen. Uh, you, again, you see the same reference, 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Uh, also talks about that for Aquila and Priscilla, that the, that, the, that, the, that the church met in their house. And so, obviously, you've got multiple references in the New Testament that the people that they assembled together in the house. Now, you know, we hear a lot about people talking about, you know, church assembling in the homes in, in light of COVID. Just keep in mind that that's, really different than what was going on here. You know, we think about worshiping in the home in light of COVID because, you know, we're in our own individual homes and maybe worshiping online. That's not the same thing as what was going on here. You just had, when you talked about worship in the home in the first few centuries, you're talking about Christians actually meeting together, assembling, right? The meaning of the word church to assemble, a gathering within different people's homes. So, because it met in the homes, you don't have as much attention being brought on Christianity because they don't have their own physical buildings, right? So, important to keep in mind. And more than likely, you know, we talked about how most Christians would have been of the lower class. It didn't mean that wealthy members, that, that some wealthy people did not embrace Christianity. And more than likely, the church would meet in the homes of a wealthier member. Uh, Philemon's a good example of that. Philemon, obviously, was somebody who had a certain degree of wealth because he, you know, he owned slaves. Uh, and so Philemon, it says that the church met in Philemon's home. 
Uh, and, and Philemon probably had a large enough house to be able to have Christians to gather. Whereas somebody who's lower, maybe not have a lar- as large of a home, might, might not have enough space for, you know, the, the, for, the, for other Christians to gather together to worship God. Uh, so that's sort of the idea there of about the uh, wealthy member. Now generally you think about it, cities probably had multiple congregations. They're, you know, just maybe because of the number of Christians, especially in larger cities, you know, one home could not house all of them. So pro- it could have been that they had their own different congregations uh, and they met in different people's houses. That, you know, that was just a way, just, just due to the fact that they may not have had enough space in one home. And so sometimes congregations, uh, you might have seen different homes uh, and that, that house different congregations. So if you're thinking about putting yourself back into those first few centuries, uh, it probably would be helpful to know people because that would be how you would know, you know where did the church assemble. You had to know whoever, uh, maybe whoever's home was usually the, the gathering place. So you probably had to have a connection to that person or at least know who they are. Um, so that may be something that's different from us. And what it turns out that later on some homes sort of became unofficial church buildings. Uh, one example of that is a place called the Dura, the Dura Europas, uh, which was constructed somewhere around 250 AD. And here is a picture of the... Uh, Here's a picture of what it looked like. Let me move myself. There we go. So again, here's a picture of what that place looked like. This is the ruins of that home. And if you note what appears to be there on the far right, where I happen to be at, let me move myself out of that far right category, or far right location on the screen. So if you look there at the far right, you see a, a set of stairs going up. And then what it looks like on, you know, immediately behind it, it looks like there's an entrance way. And more than likely what that is is actually a room uh, sort of, that sort of served as a chapel or where people would gather and worship. Sometimes the homes, if they were big enough, they had specific rooms set aside for that. And more than likely that's what's being talked about there or what's being shown there. And I want to pull up some other pictures of it. And I'm going to link this website to our Canvas page. Okay, so here is a layout of the city. Uh, Here's the layout of the city. This is the city of Dura Europus, as you see here. You've got some important buildings, the Mithraeum. You've got a synagogue within the city. And this is what's being described. That picture that you just saw is a picture of this church building. This is found on uh, the website of Yale University. But I want to look at a few of the pictures. You sort of see, you sort of see the layout of the home. Now you notice here that you've got a specific place located for the baptistry, and you can see some pictures here, right? So what you can tell, and we'll look at some more examples of the early baptistries in a little while. What you can tell is that when you walked in, there's a set of stairs that are descending down. And so you're going down, and generally the water would fill up. And so obviously this is a good example to show that baptism, at least early on, was understood to be immersion. Otherwise, you know, why do you have enough, why do you have this amount of water uh, that would fill up and you would walk down into the water? Uh, that's, that's something I think interesting to point up. Uh, within this, there appears to be some artwork too. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it is. I haven't looked at this website extensively, but you've got you've got some artwork within there. But the point being is that even within this house that sort of turned into an unofficial church, you actually had a room set aside for baptizing people. And I want to go back and see. Uh, Okay, so some of those are the same pictures there. And really what you're just looking at is the room. They're really the thing that I wanted to show you was the baptistry because I think that's pretty cool. But again, I'll link this to uh, the Canvas page. You can go and look through this more. 
they've got a little bit of a section that talks about uh, the historical background of this city and of this house as well. So uh, hopefully you uh, will take some time to look at that because I, I think it's pretty interesting. All right, so going back to our PowerPoint, again, that's the picture. So that's sort of the homes of early Christians. Again, that may that that example uh, may not have been typical of all, but that's one example that we can look at and, and know that that's sort of what uh, an early home looked like and how it eventually became converted into an unofficial church building. All right, so another place where they assembled uh, concerns the uh, obviously the temples and the synagogues, and you see this in the New Testament as well. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verses 40 verse 46 talks about Christians worshiping in the temple. Acts chapter 5 verse 42 uh, talks about Peter preaching in the temple. And then in the synagogue, Acts 18:26, uh, you know, Paul frequently visited the synagogues of the cities that he went on in his missionary journeys. Um, Acts 26 verse 11 again Paul references the synagogue there as well. Now, one, one thing to keep in mind about this is that worshiping in the temple and the synagogue, it becomes less of an option as Jewish persecution intensified because the Jews are not going to allow Christians to worship in their buildings. So early on, they worshiped in temples and synagogues and, and sought out people to talk about the Bible with in those places. But again, we keep in mind that as Jewish person, persecution becomes more prevalent, they're going to drive the, the Christians out of worshiping in, in those places. And as we talked about last week, one of the places where Christians would gather to worship were the catacombs that were built by Christians. And if you think about it, it sort of makes sense because the catacombs were the common land that sort of belonged to the church. Because, again, they argued that they were similar to burial societies. Burial societies were given land to bury their members. And so this is a common land in which all members of the church shared. And with the catacombs, generally it was cheaper to do it this way. It was cheaper to build into the ground rather than to keep buying up land to uh, bury, uh, to keep buying up land to bury people. Because you're having to buy more land, that costs more money. It became a cheaper option actually to uh, to uh, dig into the ground and to bury people in catacombs, which is why they they chose that. Uh, which is one of the reasons why they chose that option. Obviously, too, Christ was buried into the ground, and so there's some apparently there was some special significance there for for some Christians. You know, if Christ is buried in the ground, we're buried in the ground as well, buried in these in these catacombs. You know, even though Christ was buried in a tomb, some some saw some special significance in that. Uh, now, one thing I do want to point out is that you know some people look at the catacombs, and one of the one of the common ideas behind it is that Christians often use catacombs to hide from the Roman authorities uh, that that were seeking to persecute them. This might have happened occasionally, but this was not the main purpose of the catacombs. More likely, you would actually have Christians gathering here to worship than sort of gathering to hide away from the Roman authorities. Because you keep in mind, catacombs, you can see the entrance of a catacomb, you know, uh, pretty easily. You go back and look at that picture of the catacomb of Calixtus, you can see the entrance to that pretty easy. And, 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 and the Roman Empire, Roman authorities knew where Christians, where Christian catacombs were located. Because you sort of had to go through that process to be able to get the land. So there's some that say that the catacombs became famous because Christians were hiding there. That's probably a little bit exaggerated. More than likely, they all, they, they, the importance of the catacombs in part came from Christians' ability to assemble and worship there, which again is pretty interesting uh, because that, that sort of, uh, you think about trying to, to worship in a cemetery, right? That's uh, maybe a little bit... Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it makes you think a little bit more, right, of, the, uh, of your own self in light of eternity, considering you're around people that have already died. Uh, whatever the case may be, Christians did this. Sometimes within the catacombs, you actually had rooms that were constructed, not for the burying of the dead, but also for giving enough space for people to be able to worship. And so this is why when we look back at the catacomb with the artwork with uh, the Lord's Supper on it, 
This is why you had artwork of things like that inside the catacombs because that's what Christians were doing in the catacombs. Sometimes they would partake of the Lord's Supper. They would worship among uh, in these catacombs because it was a common area which they could gather. What also comes from these catacombs too is that they uh, it became common for Christians to go in there and on the days in which the martyrs had died, uh, the anniversaries of those days, they would go in and have sort of a small celebration of that. Which that sort of goes back to our, you know, question we talked or we talked about in discussion that I, I presented to you about, you know, how often do we think about those that died for the cause of Christ? Because that's something that's that 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 became common among these early Christians was to go and to remember, have a day set aside to remember those that died uh, defending the faith. And so that that's that's important to keep in mind that uh, catacombs became a place to celebrate the lives of martyrs. All right, so that's sort of, those are the main locations where Christians assembled. Um, there might have been some other places, but those are the main ones that we want to talk about. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of worship. And there are two statements that I want to look at uh, as we move forward. Now, we've already talked about this one before, Pliny's statement to Trajan about uh, how Christians worship. And both of these quotes come from the second century. The one we'll look at in a minute, and this one come from the second century. Again, this is what Pliny said. They asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God. Now, that's interesting to note because you think about how many people struggle to get up to go to worship services on Sunday morning, and here you've got people that are getting up before dawn to go and, and worship. Um, so that, that, that's kind of interesting to point out. You see that they, they bind themselves. They're not going to commit crime, fraud, theft, adultery. Uh, when this is over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. And again, that was plenty subtly suggesting uh, that he knew about the rumors that were spread about Christians, which we'll talk about next week. But you sort of get an indication of how the worship service worked from Pliny. They met on a fixed day, which Justin Martyr is going to point out is Sunday. They sang a hymn to Christ. Um, they bound themselves to an oath. More than likely, um, this is probably a reference to preaching in, in, to a certain degree. And then uh, there at the last, probably the partaking of the Lord's Supper, what, what is being referenced there. This is another quote, and this comes from a man named Justin Martyr, who we talked about last week as one of the apologists. This is his description of the uh, this is his description of the worship practice, or, the, or how Christians worshipped, and this is from the mid second century. He says, "The day that is commonly called Sunday, all those believers who live in the cities or the fields gather, and in their meetings, as much as time allows, is read from the memoirs of the apostles." or from the writings of the prophets. Then once the reader is through, the one presiding offers a verbal exhortation, urging us to follow these beautiful examples. Immediately after this, we all stand as one and raise our prayers, after which, as I have already said, bread, wine, and water are offered, and the president, as he is able, also sends to God his prayers and thanksgiving, and all the people respond, Amen. So you see the day in which they worshiped on Sunday. You sort of see what's described here and and what they did. They read from the memoirs of the apostles. This is probably a reference to the accounts of the gospel and the letters of maybe the apostles, like Paul's letters, Peter's letters. Uh, it could also reference the book of Acts as well. But you also see the writings of the prophets, the Old Testament. So you've got, they're, they're meeting on a single, on a specific day. They come together, there's a reading from Scripture. And then after the reading of Scripture, you've got someone who comes and, as, it, as Justin says, offers a verbal exhortation, urging us to follow these beautiful examples. So in other words, you've got an individual that reads and explains Scripture, and then you have another individual that comes up and essentially makes the application or gives the application to the audience, to the, to the members that have assembled. So after this, they stand, they raise, they pray, um, 
And then you see they begin to partake of the Lord's Supper. This is the first half of it. This is the second half of Justin Martyr's quote. One more. There we go. Now follows the distribution and partaking of the nourishment that has been consecrated by thanksgiving. And they are sent by means of the, de of the deacons to those who are not present. So this is talking about the Lord's Supper. And so what's also being presented here is that those, for whatever reason, that could not assemble on that day, the deacons were responsible for taking the Lord's Supper to those that were absent, according to what Justin Martyr describes here. He goes on to say, those who can and will freely give what seems best to them, and the offering is given to the president or the presider. With this, he helps orphans and widows, those who are in need because of illness or any other reason, those who are in prison, sojourners, and in short, the, pres the president or presider provides for any who are in need. We hold this general gathering on Sunday because it is the first day in which God, transforming darkness and matter, created the world and also the day in which Jesus Christ, our Savior, rose from the dead. So you've got after the, the preaching, they stand together, then they partake of the Lord's Supper, and then at the end they give. And so what this shows to us is that there are two main sections of worship that Justin describes here, at least in the church in the second century. And these two portions are a first portion that consisted of the reading of Scripture, the explanation of Scripture, the application, and then singing and prayer. Justin doesn't mention it here, uh, but in other passages like, uh, in other passages like, uh, or other things like Pliny suggest that there's also singing connected with it. That's the first part. And then the second part of the worship service consisted of taking of the Lord's Supper and then giving, based on what we have just read. Now, Justin did point out, and I'll go back to this, that they stood it's on this first one. You know, after the, after the exhortation, immediately after this, we all stand as one and raise our prayers. This might have been typical of the congregation where Justin Martyr was around, but there were other congregations that, uh, that, that did not sit down during worship service. In fact, depending on where you're at, you, if you were in the, in the second, third century and you go to one of these houses or wherever, the catacombs or wherever they're assembling uh, to worship together, uh, it very well could be that you were expected to stand for the entirety of the worship service. And so that's something that's a little bit different from our time because, you know, we have pews. We have, we, there are certain times where we sit. Obviously, if you had to stand the entire service, you know, most, you know, I, I guarantee a lot of people wouldn't come to service anymore if you had to stand the entire time, whether that's, you know, health reasons or you, you find it an inconvenience. But the point being is that within some congregations then, they actually stood for the entirety of the worship service, which I think is interesting. And, and that's one way in which it's a little bit different than, uh, a little bit different than, than how we conduct ours today. Not that that's a salvation issue, but you know it's just something interesting to note. All right, let's talk about singing. Uh, so you saw plenty talk about singing a hymn. You keep in mind that you know the singing of hymns it had been important to the Jewish worship to God. Uh, you know sometimes there were cases where you see instruments being used, but generally that was used only on special days and on special occasions. And from what I gathered. From my research, it seems that many Christians remained opposed to the usage of instrumental music even after the first century. And it's not going to be till, I believe, the sixth or seventh century where instrumental music becomes prevalent within worship. So that's important to keep in mind. And I've got a quote here that sort of illustrates this. This comes from a man that we talked about last week, Clement of Alexandria. And this is what he has to say about the usage of mechanical instruments in worship. He says, For if people occupy their time with pipes and psalteries and choirs and dances and Egyptian clapping of hands and such disorderly frivolities, they become quite immodest and intractable, beat on cymbals and drums, and make a noise on instruments of delusion for plainly such a banquet as seems to me as a theater, theater of drunkenness. For the apostle decrees that putting off the works of darkness, we should put on the armor of light, walking honestly as in the day, not spending our time in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness. Let the pipe be resigned to the shepherds and let the flute to the superstitious who are engrossed 
in idolatry. So what Clement of Alexandria sort of gives as an indication here is that not only do people not use musical instruments or do they try to convince people to use musical instruments, there was this idea that the usage of mu uh, musical mechanical instruments in worship was connected to the unholy practices of the Roman uh, religion, the Roman paganism, uh, that they were connected to the festivals. And so because of this connection, uh, Clement's saying, uh, you know, don't use them because, of the, because they had a connection to that, which, which would indicate to us more than likely is that um, there wasn't the usage of mechanical instruments early on. Now, obviously, we can talk about what the New Testament says, and, and obviously that holds true about what Paul says about singing in Colossians 3, Ephesians chapter 5. But I think it is interesting to note that from the quote of Clement of Alexandria that the usage of mechanical instruments in worship was thought of as being connected to some, sort of the unholy things that were, were taking place in, Roman, in the Roman religion. So, you know, that's interesting to know. That probably could be used as further evidence to suggest that uh, it's not till later centuries before Christians uh, began to commonly use instruments of music in their worship service. There's also something else that I want to point out, um, and this will be pretty interesting. We're actually going to listen to this in a moment. But one of the oldest hymns that has been discovered written by Christians is a hymn called the Oxyrhynchus Hymn. And don't worry, I'm not going to make you spell that. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the hymn to the Holy Trinity on your quiz. So um, you might want to get Oxyrhynchus down, just know how to spell it, but I'm going to refer to it as the hymn to the Holy Trinity because that's obviously easier to remember. So this is a hymn that was discovered in the early 20th century uh, it was found written on a uh, papyrus that was found in Egypt. It dates to about the 3rd century, so you're talking about the 200s AD. Now, one thing to keep in mind about early music is that most early hymns did not have musical notation. So if we got out a songbook and looked at its contents inside, you know, we can sort of see the, the notes and the time, uh, the, you know, the speed in which the song is sung, uh, things like that, you know, if you're not familiar with music, maybe you, you're not able to read it. Uh, but still, that, that those notations are there, and they're important because for people that, that, that know music, um, that's how you know how the song is supposed to be sung. That's how you know what notes go with certain words and things like that. So we can get an idea of how a song is going to be sung based on looking at the notes, uh, the, the key, the time, and, uh, you know, if there are certain words or, or, or certain, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, you have things like, uh, you have certain words that indicate the speed of the song. I can't remember the word for it. But in our hymn books, we have musical notation. Um, but that notation didn't, doesn't come about till much later after when this hymn was written. Now, the Greeks did have a system of notation that was uh, archaic to us, and what it turns out is that in this hymn that we also have recorded on that papyri the, the Greek uh, musical notation that went along with the song. And thanks to people that are expert musicologists, they were able to decipher how the song was to be sung and the style in which it was sung. And, and essentially you had a good idea. Uh, they came up with a pretty good idea of how the song was originally sung. And so what we're actually going to do now is listen to the, uh, a version of that song. Now this song does have instruments uh, does have instruments in it. I could not find one that did not. Um, so uh, we sort of have to do the best that we can, but I think it is interesting to listen to this. Maybe it gives us an idea of how uh, hymns sounded back then. So if we were to go into a a congregation where Christians are assembling and we heard them sing, maybe this is what it sort of sounded like apart from the, the instruments and music. Now I don't know if I'll be able to hear this as you're hearing it, um, so I'll try to turn my volume down and let you listen to it. I will scroll down and let you look at the lyrics um, 
I'll start playing the song and then I'll, I'll scroll down to where I think somebody comments what the lyrics are. Either that or it's given in the description of the video. Um, but let me turn my volume down and I'll let you listen to the song. stop it there. Um, hopefully that gives you an idea of maybe what uh, the, the singing of hymns at least sounded like in the in the uh, in the, the second and third centuries if that makes sense. Now you may know that uh, that there were some moments where it seemed like they were talking in the midst of them singing. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why that is to be honest with you. Um, Maybe that was a part of the, the, the singing as well, that people would talk within it. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I hope you found that interesting. I know I did, um, because I've often wondered, you know, we think about how we sing hymns today. Did it sound similar to how they sang back in the second and third century? Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty interesting to look at. So we'll go back and to our PowerPoint. Right, so that again, that was the hymn. All right, let's talk about preaching for a moment. Um, how preaching worked. So, at least early on, it was probably true that not every Christian had their own personal copy of the completed Bible, uh, especially for the most of the uh, of the first four centuries. Mainly because it's extremely expensive to have a book made for you. And the Bible, of course, is a pretty long book, so you know to have your own completed copy probably probably didn't have your own personal copy, and more than likely they had to sort of share uh, the, uh, the the copies of Scripture, you know, amongst themselves. Maybe that's how that worked. But when it came to the actual practice of sermon writing, uh, sermons were often given, but at the same time they were also written down. And they were sort of distributed like letters were. In fact, there is a letter called Second Clement that at one point was attributed to Clement of Rome, but it's one of the earliest examples of a sermon that we have outside of the New Testament. But these sermons would often be written down, and they would be distributed for other people to read. And not only that, people would actually preach them again. Other other preachers would go on and, and maybe preach the same sermon that was preached in another location that they were given by another preacher. Uh, 
Um, so that idea of sermon sharing uh, is something that actually goes back to almost really the, the beginning of the church. Um, if you didn't have a preacher, as was the case sometimes, um, in a lot of cases the elders were actually the ones responsible for doing the preaching. Now, you know, in the early stages of Christianity, you, you saw men like Paul and, and, and uh, Timothy and Titus. They went from, sometimes they went from place to place preaching. But as you start to have more congregations develop, there's not as much of a need for it. And so apparently what develops is that you've got elders and later on whenever, you know, the office of the bishop, like Ignatius uh, thought, is put over the eldership as a whole, those individuals would be the ones responsible for the preaching. Um, and so that's sort of how preaching went down, how, how sermons were, um, the fact that sermons were written down, and who would do a lot of the preaching early on. And one thing I want to look at, well actually let's talk about this for a moment. You do have different opinions about the style of preaching, and these are two men that we have not talked about yet, um, Augustine or Augustine of Hippo and, and John Chrysostom. Both of these guys come from the around the 300s AD, um, so that's the 4th century. And both of them actually talked about the, uh, the different styles of preaching. And even you know today you hear about preachers having different styles and people preferring one style over another. Um, even back in the 4th the century, the 300s, you had debates about preaching styles. Um, Augustine, for instance, wanted his students that were training to become preachers, he wanted them to have an attractive preaching style, to be able to um, impress the audience, uh, that they sounded like good speakers. And that's what he put a lot of time in, developing the, the, uh, the oratorial skills of his students. But you got a man named John Chrysostom who sort of went the other direction of that. Um, who said, you know, don't spend so much time, you know, spend time on, on working on your delivery, but don't focus so much on it that you, you attract people because of how well you can speak rather than the message that you're speaking. And so those two different perspectives were sort of debated. Uh, it appears from Augustine and John Chrysostom. Now what is interesting to note that not just these different styles of preaching, but even, even these men had similar concerns, even Christians then and preachers had, had similar concerns about their audience, uh, about the members that they preach to as we do today, some of those same concerns. So let's look at some of those similar concerns. So one, we think about this idea about losing the audience's attention. Right? We talk about how we have a hard time keeping, keeping our, our, our attention focused during sermons because of how fast our world works and technology and things like that. Well, it turns out that back in the 300s, you had preachers that were concerned about losing the audience's attention. Now, this is a quote from Augustine, and he said, It is likewise a frequent occurrence that one who at first listened to us with all readiness becomes exhausted either by the effect of hearing or by standing and now no longer commends what is said, but gapes and yawns, and even unwillingly exhibits a disposition to depart. And this is Augustine talking about the people that he preached to, how they had a tendency to lose focus and start thinking about other things, even thinking about what they're going to do when they leave, yawning and, and, and things like that. Uh, and so one of the things that Augustine would say later on is that, you know, sometimes you might want to insert an illustration uh, to try to draw their attention back in, which you know preachers do that today. Uh, but even then, in the 300s, you know people had a hard time keeping their attention on the sermon that the the preacher was preaching. You also had a similar concern about a congregation that did not study their Bible like they should have. This is a quote that comes from John Chrysostom. He says, "Therefore, everything is neglected." For which of you, when in his house, takes some Christian book in hand and goes over its contents and searches the Scriptures? How many of you are studying? None can say that he does so. But with most we shall find few, or we shall find draughts and dice, but books nowhere. Talking about entertainment games instead of reading of the Bible. Except among, but books nowhere except among a few. And even these few have the same dispositions as the many, for they tie up their books and keep them away, always put away in cases, 
and all their cares for the fineness of the parchments and the beauty of the letters, not for reading them. For they have not bought them to obtain advantage and benefit from them, but take pains about such matters to show their wealth and pride. So you've got people that sort of have this idea of, you know, they own a Bible and they like how elegant and how nice it looks, but they don't ever open it. And that's not all that different from some people today. You know, some people, they have Bibles in their houses that you can find them on different places, but some of those people don't open them and ever read them. They don't ever study from the Bibles that they have. And so John Chrysostom is pointing out something about his congregation that apparently you've got uh, what appears to be a prevalence of Bibles, but nobody's studying their Bible. Um, and so, whereas that's a common thing for preachers to talk about today, that was a common thing that they were concerned with back then. In addition to that, they, believe it or not, had a problem, some preachers had a problem with members of their congregation not wanting or struggling to come to worship service. This is a quote that comes from John Chrysostom as well. It says, The Scriptures are divine charms. Let us then apply to ourselves and to the passions of our souls the remedies to be derived from them. For if we understand what is, for what it is that is read, we shall hear it with much readiness. I am always saying this and will not cease to say it. Is it not strange that those who sit by the market can tell the names and families and cities of charioteers and dancers, and the kinds of power possessed by each, and can, exact, and can give exact account of the good or bad qualities of the very horses? But that those who should come hither should know nothing of what is done here, but should be ignorant of the number, even of the sacred books. So, again, what's being described here, that middle section, those that sit in the market can tell the names of families and cities and charioteers. These are people that are concerned with, that have a great knowledge of all the, maybe the athletic games that the uh, that people participated in. They could tell you everything about the entertainment of the city, but when it came to talking about the Bible, they had no knowledge of it. They were more likely to be found sitting in the marketplace talking about these ideas rather than taking the time to come to worship. And as John points out, that for some of these people, they couldn't even tell you how many books were in the Bible compared to being able to list off the names of the professional athletes of the day and, and to be able to talk about entertainment and, and politics and things like that. Now, you think about that in our own time. You know, we, we, we think about people struggling to come to worship. Even then, that was a problem, a problem as well. And that might be a, a question we talk about in discussion on Wednesday night about, uh, you know, does does entertainment and things like that act, is that the real reason why people don't come to worship anymore is that something that's unique to our own time um, maybe that gives you food for thought if you're able to watch this video before then um, so even then preachers they preached about people not coming to worship because apparently that was a problem um, which i think is really interesting you know because it shows that we're really not all that different maybe you would uh, you know, if you go back then, you sort of heard the same messages as, as what, we, uh, what we often hear today. Now, I do want you to know this. This is Augustine's three styles of preaching. I'll make sure you get this down. One of the styles was somber, uh, what he called somber. And this was just whenever you taught something new, this is something serious. This is to be informative. It's not necessarily supposed to be sad, but... You're supposed to be serious about it, is what Augustine said. So anytime you taught something new, you want to be very serious about it, be direct about it, and be informative about it. At other times, your preaching, it wants to consist of what's called beauty, or you make the message appealing to the audience. Maybe you use some illustrations in there, or you, uh, you, you just sort of have a way of speaking that, that gains the audience's attention. You're not necessarily informing them, but you're just trying to give them a message that appeals to them. Maybe that's a positive message like the ability to struggle despite, or the ability to persevere despite struggling against uh, persecution or something like that. that. That could be one way. And then the third way was the idea of being persuasive or just having the ability or, or constructing a sermon that would cause the people to either change their mind about how they're living in sin or to get them to act and to become more faithful and, and more active in the church. And that was Augustine's three, uh, three styles of preaching. Now these last two I'll, I'll talk about very briefly 
Um, Because we'll talk about this more with um, one we've already talked about a a little bit, and then the other we'll talk with the Lord's Supper, we'll talk more when we get to Catholicism. So some general thoughts about it to begin with. Um, Only members could take, what appears it to be is that, again, that only members could take the Lord's Supper. Now, we obviously, um, generally we emphasize that within our own congregations as well. Um, Not necessarily that it's wrong for somebody who who doesn't understand what's going on. You know, I've been in that position sometimes where I've served somebody and I didn't necessarily know whether they were a Christian or not. I just served them anyway um, because I I didn't want to, to leave them out in case they had been. Right, and there's no, really nothing wrong with that. They're just drinking, um, you know. That they they're not they don't understand what's going on. Um, sort of like the idea of baptism. Somebody who doesn't understand what baptism is, all they're doing is getting wet. Well, the way that this apparently was practiced then is that you keep in mind that they had those two sections of worship service. So in one section, you would have the reading of scripture, the explanation, the application, the singing, and the praying. That was one section, and then after that section, what would happen in a lot of congregations is that they would dismiss everyone who was not a member. And then once all of them had been dismissed, that's when the Christians could partake of the Lord's Supper. And so um, that's something that we don't see today because you know whenever the Lord's Supper is served, Generally in congregations, we don't see this today. Whenever the Lord's Supper is served, you don't see the people that are not members get up and leave the auditorium while this is going on. We just, uh, we just, we just know not to serve them. But apparently what happened is people would get up and leave, and that's when they could serve the Lord's Supper once all those non-members had left. Um, and and the, the Lord's Supper, one of the main points behind it was to emphasize unity within the church, how they were all united. Um, and, of course, you think about Paul's statements in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, his big critique there with the church in Corinth when it came to the Lord's Supper is that they were divided between rich and poor, uh, which was not the case to be. Um, this also sort of gives emphasis to, you know, that they took of communion in the catacombs. You know, they're thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. As they're taking of the communion surrounded by people that have already been died and buried and are essentially waiting the resurrection. So maybe there's some special significance in, in those early Christians taking of the Lord's Supper in those catacombs. And because of the nature of how they partook of the Lord's Supper, you have a lot of rumors that are going to be spread about Christians, which again we'll talk about next week because a lot of these rumors are going to be spread by uh, Roman uh, by, by Roman. Uh, philosophers, officials, citizens that are not members of the church, and this is going to lead to further persecution of the church. I do want to talk about the word Eucharist. We've heard this word before. It's generally um, one way in which people describe the Lord's Supper. Um, The word Eucharist just simply means to give thanks. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23-24, again, Paul, in that passage, he's recounting the words of Jesus earlier when he talked about how um, when he talked about how uh, Christ you know blessed the the, uh, the Lord's Supper the the bread and the fruit of the vine and it said that he gave thanks and that's where the, that that word that phrase to give thanks there in that passage is actually what's translated as Eucharist so that's where that word comes from generally the people that use that are Catholics Anglicans uh, Lutherans in the Orthodox Church are the are the people that primarily use the term Eucharist. We usually say the Lord's Supper or Communion. Now later on, one of the developments that we'll talk about more with Catholicism is this idea of transubstantiation, where the blood and body of Christ actually become the real thing, whereas we understand it to be representative of the body of Christ and representative of the blood. Those that develop this idea of transubstantiation, essentially say that once you part- when you're partaking of the, the bread, that it turns into the body of Christ. When you partake of the fruit of the vine, that it turns into the blood of Christ. And we'll talk about that more um, because that's going to be connected with Catholicism. And I also do want to mention that slide just popped. There we go. I had that slide copied, I guess. Uh, the Love Feast. Um, you might have heard about this before, um, but the love feast—they are uh, 
supposedly meals that Christians had. Maybe they were similar to our fellowship meals uh, as a way of uh, of, of uh, 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 maybe as a way of uh, communing with one another. The two passages that people try to point to to say that. Um, that, that are often mentioned as examples of the love feast are 1 Corinthians 11 and Jude, chap, and Jude 1, verse 12. Um, again, I, I, I mean, it, I think in those classes you'll talk about that, that idea there. Um, there was, the one thing that we do want to point out is that sometimes it, it appears that in the 2nd and 3rd century that sometimes communion was taken during uh, taken while they were having what were called these love feasts. Um, but the problem with the love feast is that they, they, they received a lot of criticism because you know you had maybe something similar to what happened in 1 Corinthians 11 where at these feasts you had a great amount of excess of food. And a lot of people had a lot of food. There were people that had no, no food and that was true for these love feasts and they received a lot of criticism and for that reason they become increasingly less popular as time moves on and even into even in today there are only a handful of small denominational groups that actually have something similar to a love feast in their service um, but there were a lot of a lot of problems with that um, we can obviously be safe to say you know first Corinthians 11 you know is talking about the Lord's Supper maybe they and maybe Paul's rebuke there is that they have turned the Lord's Supper into this extravagant feast, which was not um, what they should have been doing in the first place, um, which would indicate that, again, these love feasts were not, uh, were not approved of by God. Um, and then finally, let's mention this. We're already at 56 minutes. Um, I'll just go ahead and say we'll stop here for this week. We'll only have two parts of lecture because we're already really at two hours anyway, and I can... The, the next section, the fate of the apostles, may tie in a little bit more with uh, persecution as well. All right, baptism. So one of the things that developed, sometimes you had further instruction that was given uh, in order to be baptized. And, and this especially was true for those that came from a pagan background. Um, because somebody who did not know the Old Testament scriptures may not have understood um, the significance of purification and, and, and things like that. So those from a pagan background often in the second and third century is what became common was that they that Christians required people from these backgrounds to go through further training in understanding the Bible before they could be baptized. And what this eventually leads to is what's called the catechism, which if you know uh, Catholicism, uh, Catholicism uh, has its own catechism, and, and these are just rules and instructions that are to in, instruct someone about the process of becoming a Christian. And we'll talk about that more later on um, as we get to talk more about Catholicism. And then I will say this, Cyprian of Carthage, this might be of interest to you, 200 to 250 AD, he's one of the first proponents that talks about the need for infant baptism. And for Cyprian, uh, he, he was apparently an advocate of it. I, I went back, I don't have his quote here, I looked at his writing. He was an advocate of infant baptism, and so uh, more than likely he's, he, he, and he, he sort of represents one of the first proponents of infant baptism. So if you're thinking about when did infant baptism begin, the process of it really traces back to the third century rather than having its roots connected into the New Testament. Okay, and then I want to close. These are a couple pictures of the... These are a couple pictures of... Um, of baptistries, actually. Um, and what you're noticing here is that, you know, like that baptistry we saw in the Dura, the Dura Europus, or the Dura Europus, however you want to pronounce that, Again, you see a, this is an early baptistry from the, somewhere around the 4th century. And again, you can see that it's built into the ground where you had to step down and walk into it. And so you had enough water to be fully immersed. At the same time, here's another one. This is a little bit smaller. It's in the shape of the cross. But again, you see the same idea. You're stepping down into the water to be baptized, to be immersed. And that's sort of how it, that's sort of how it uh, looked. That's further evidence to suggest that you know baptism...
early on was understood to be complete immersion of the body. And those again are a couple of examples. We're really about to run out of time, so I will go ahead and stop it here. Again, I'll provide that link to the website, the Yale University website that talks about that, that, that home that was converted into a church building.